Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? In the late 18th century, in William Blake's famous poem, The Tiger, we hear a new note in poetry. A note never heard in the social, reasonable work of his predecessors, even when, like Rochester, he protested against reason. There were new notions of individuality, of freedom and liberty, and of the power of the imagination. The French and American revolutions were part of this. These historical happenings fed on the writings of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And it was Rousseau, too, in his persuasive urgings away from artificiality and back to nature, who influenced poets, novelists, and painters to see themselves and the world in a new light. We still live in a state of mind and being which has been determined by romanticism. We are still, in a sense, romantics. One of the most extraordinary romantic pioneers was Christopher Smart. Smart began fairly conventionally. Dawn at Cambridge, the writer of poems on such themes as the attributes of the supreme being, which had some success in their time, but in his late twenties, he left Cambridge with a reputation for being a heavy drinker and a bit unstable and plunged into the rackety and overworked life of a freelance writer. Gradually ruined by bouts of manic behavior, towards the end of his life, he spent several years in lunatic asylums. There he wrote a great deal, including his finest and strangest poem, Jubilati Agno, Rejoice in the Lamb, which wasn't properly published until 1954. Jubilati Agno isn't, when you look at it, a work of madness, but of celebration. It's a chorus or litany of praise to God for the wonders of creation, including Smart's own cat, Geoffrey, to which one whole section is devoted. Years before Blake, Smart wrote, for the cherub cat is a form of the angel tiger. For I will consider my cat, Geoffrey. He is the servant of the living God, duly and daily serving him. For at the first glance of the glory of God in the East, he worships in his way. For this is done by weaving his body seven times round with elegant quickness. For having done duty and received blessing, he begins to consider himself. For this he performs in ten degrees. For first, he looks upon his forepaws to see if they are clean. For secondly, he kicks up behind to clean away there. For thirdly, he works it upon stretch with the forepaws extended. For fourthly, he sharpens his paws by wood. For fifthly, he washes himself. For sixthly, he rolls upon wash. For seventhly, he flees himself that he may not be interrupted upon the beat. For eighthly, he rubs himself against a post. For ninthly, he looks up for his instructions for tenthly, he goes in quest of food. For having considered God and himself, he will consider his neighbor. For if he meets another cat, he will kiss her in kindness. For when he takes his prey, he plays with it to give it a chance. For one mouse in seven escapes by his dallying. For when his day's work is done, his business more properly begins. For he keeps the Lord's watch in the night against the adversary. He counteracts the powers of darkness by his electrical skin and glaring eyes. For he counteracts the devil, who is death, by brisking about the life. For in his morning orisons, he loves the sun, and the sun loves him. For he is of the tribe.
grave of the tiger. For the cherub cat is a term of the angel tiger. For he has the subtlety and hissing of a serpent, which in goodness he suppresses. For he will not do destruction if he is well fed. Neither will he spit without provocation. For he purrs in thankfulness when God tells him he's a good cat. For he is an instrument for the children to learn benevolence upon. For every house is incomplete without him, and a blessing is lacking in the spirit. For the Lord commanded Moses concerning the cats at the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt. For every family had one cat at least in the bag. For the English cats are the best in Europe. For he is a mixture of gravity and waggery. For he knows that God is his savior. For there is nothing sweeter than his peace when it rests. For there is nothing brisker than his life when in motion. For he is of the Lord's poor, and so indeed is he called by benevolence perpetually. Poor Jeffrey, poor Jeffrey, the rat has bit thy throat. For I bless the Lord Jesus that Jeffrey is better. For the divine spirit comes about his body to sustain it in complete cat. For his tongue is exceeding pure, so that it has in purity what it wants in music. For he is docile and can learn certain things. For he can spraggle upon waggle at the word of command. For he can jump from an eminence into his master's bosom. For he can catch a cork and toss it again. For he camels his back to bear the first notion of business. For he is good to think on, if a man would express himself neatly. For he was made a great figure in Egypt for his signal services. For he killed the ichneumon rat, very pernicious by land. For by stroking of him, I have found out electricity. For I perceived God's light about him, both wax and fire. For the electrical fire is the spiritual substance which God sends from heaven to sustain the bodies both of man and beast. For God has blessed him in the variety of his movements. For though he cannot fly, he is an excellent clamberer. For his motions upon the face of the earth are more than any other quadruped. For he can tread to all the measures upon the music. For he can swim for life. For he can creep. Christopher Smart's loving, exuberant, eccentric itemizing of one particular creature is concentrated into something emblematic by William Blake. Blake's poems are emblems in a double sense, because alongside them, as part of the whole design, Blake made copper etchings which he then colored by hand, the whole series making up two books. He wanted those who looked at them and looked into them to have a total experience to be both readers and spectators. Blake's poem, The Tiger, one of that group he called Songs of Experience, as opposed to his Songs of Innocence, is a very naked confrontation with one of God's many puzzles. Did God create power and evil as well as gentleness and good? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? 
Blake's songs of innocence and experience are subtitled showing the two contrary states of the human soul. The tiger and the lamb are equal and opposite products of God's creation, twins in the paradox of life. At one level, that of extreme simplicity, Blake wrote the songs of innocence, poems so clear and transparent, like Holy Thursday, that often they are like anonymous children's songs, lyrics that have been there from the beginning. T'was on a Holy Thursday, their innocent faces keen, the children walking two and two in red and blue and green. Gray-headed beagles walked before with wands as white as snow, till into the high dome of Paul's they like Thames waters flow. Oh, what a multitude they seemed, these flowers of London town. Seated in companies they sit with radiance all their own. The hum of multitudes was there, but multitudes of lambs, thousands of little boys and girls raising their innocent hands. Now, like a mighty wind, they raise to heaven the voice of song, or like harmonious thunderings, the seats of heaven among. Beneath them sit the aged men, wise guardians of the poor. Then cherish pity, lest you drive an angel from your door. That poem, Holy Thursday, from Songs of Innocence, is balanced by a poem with exactly the same title from Songs of Experience, which begins, Is this a holy thing to see in a rich and fruitful land? Babes reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurous hand. Is that trembling cry a song? Can it be a song of joy? And so many children poor, it is a land of poverty. And in his poem, London, on the face of it, one of his grimmest, a beam of light illuminates the boy as he leads the old man through each chartered street. I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames doth flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse Blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plague the marriage hearth. Much of Blake's poetry is a plea for openness, honesty, acceptance of true feeling. As he wrote in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, for everything that lives is holy. This too is part of what we mean by romanticism. In Blake's case, it comes across with a mystical simplicity, a psychological plainness about human complexities that sometimes seems to anticipate Freudian analysis more than a hundred years before it existed. As in his poem, A Poison Tree, which is like a fable about emotional repression. I was angry with my friend. I told my wrath. My wrath did end. I was angry with my foe, I told it not, my wrath did grow. And I watered it in fear, night and morning with my tears. And I sunned it with smiles, and with soft deceitful wiles. And it grew both day and night, till it bore an apple bright, and my foe beheld it shine and he knew that it was mine. And into my garden stole when the night had veiled the pole. In the morning, glad I see my foe outstretched 
beneath the tree. And in the clod and the pebble, St. Paul's words about love from the epistle to Corinthians are again put into the form of a fable or a parable in which what the clod of clay says and what the pebble says exist together as innocence and experience exist together. Blake was a master of aphorism, the paradoxical proverb. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sung a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet, but a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. But William Blake was an isolated figure, a prophet and a mystic, who had almost no influence on his contemporaries and very little on his successors till our own century. His later poems, the difficult messages of such prophetic books as Jerusalem and Milton, came out of that extreme isolation, the work of a dedicated and lonely man without an audience. But there were other writers, Blake's younger contemporaries, who, without really knowing him or his work, were more immediately changing habitual attitudes to poetry. In 1798, two men in their late twenties published together anonymously a book which quite consciously set out to demonstrate a new way. William Wordsworth from Cumberland and Samuel Taylor Coleridge from Devon had met shortly before, and together they planned this book, Lyrical Ballads. As Coleridge years later described what their intentions were, he wrote that Wordsworth's object was to give the charm of novelty to things of every day and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by awakening the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us. Coleridge said of himself that his own endeavors should be directed to persons and characters supernatural or at least romantic. That is, in the meaning Coleridge intended, inventive, imaginative. But in that same year, 1798, he wrote another poem, which wasn't published until several years later and the circumstances of which Coleridge himself surrounded with a mystery that has become a legend, Kubla Khan. He subtitled it A Vision in a Dream. His account of how he wrote it tells of sitting in his cottage on the Somerset Devon borders, taking an anodyne, as he calls it, probably laudanum, to which he became addicted, because he felt ill, and thus falling asleep while he was reading a 17th century book. He says he slept for three hours, and was aware of dreaming two or three hundred lines, which when he woke, he began to transcribe, until he says, at this moment he was unfortunately called out by a person on business from Porlock, and detained by him above an hour. And on his return to his room, found to his no small surprise and mortification, that though he still retained some vague and dim recollection of the general purport of the vision, yet with the exception of some eight or ten scattered lines and images, all the rest had passed away like the images on the surface of a stream into which a stone has been cast. Doubt has been expressed as to whether this is an entirely true account of the poem's composition. The poem itself draws most subtly and strangely on Coleridge's wide reading, but its force is very much that of the subtitle, A Vision in a Dream. He also calls it a fragment, but you could say that a great deal of romantic poetry is fragmentary. The connections are left to us. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. So twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round, and there were gardens bright with sinuous rills where blossomed many an incense-bearing tree, and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery. But oh, that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedar cover, 
a savage place, as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman wailing for her demon lover. And from this chasm, with ceaseless turmoil seething, as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing, a mighty fountain momently was forced, amid whose swift half-intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thrasher's flail. Amid these dancing rocks at once and ever, it flung up momently the sacred river. Five miles meandering with a mazy motion, through wood and dale the sacred river ran, then reached the caverns measureless to man, and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean. Amid this tumult, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight twould win me that with music loud and long, I would build that dome in air, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. And all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honey dew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. Coleridge's friend William Wordsworth was a much more prolific and indeed a much more important poet. But before we leave these romantic pioneers, Smart, Blake, Coleridge, and our first four centuries of verse, here is another kind of visionary poem by Wordsworth. A vision of this world rather than the vision of a dream. In the year 1803, Wordsworth went on a tour of Scotland. He was fascinated by hearing Gaelic spoken though, of course, he couldn't understand it. A couple of years later, emotion recollected in tranquility, he wrote this short poem, a scene caught and recorded and preserved forever, an emotion commemorated. Behold her, single in the field, yon solitary highland lass, reaping and singing by herself. Stop here, or gently pass. Alone she cuts and binds the grain and sings a melancholy strain. Oh, listen, for the veil profound is overflowing with the sound. No nightingale did ever chaunt more welcome notes to weary bands of travelers in some shady haunt among Arabian sands. A voice so thrilling ne'er was heard in springtime from the cuckoo bird, breaking the silence of the seas among the farthest Hebrides. Will no one tell me what she sings? Perhaps the plaintive numbers flow from old, unhappy, far-off things and battles long ago, or is it some more humble lay, familiar matter of today, some natural sorrow, loss, or pain that has been and may be again. Whate'er the theme, the maiden sang as if her song could have no ending. I saw her singing at her work and o'er the sickle bending. I listened, motionless and still. And as I mounted up the hill, the music in my heart I bore, long after it was heard no more. 